morning, everybody. Let's get up. All right, PowerPoint <clears throat> always helps. And let's get cracking because we've got a bunch of stuff to cover today. So it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind. Can I say it in Jess? All right. So today we're going to cover all of meiosis, right? And ah, uh, looking around chat. It's going to be a bit of a wild ride because there's a lot of stuff to cover. And there's some really kind of nuggety business to talk about. So to, I can do this in a couple of different ways. One is about studying of this, right? So meiosis consists of two rounds of cell division. Right, we'll get into the details in a bit, so don't worry about that too much. Meiosis one is where pretty much everything interesting happens. Right, it is also the most complicated part of meiosis. Meiosis two, the second round of cell division, is kind of analogous to mitosis. So if you got mitosis down, which hopefully you do by now, meiosis two is pretty straightforward. Meiosis one is not. Right, that's where all the crazy stuff happens. And so I'm gonna spend most of the time today on meiosis one and what happens in meiosis one, right? Because that, there's a lot of stuff going on. And really what happens in meiosis one is basically the foundation of the variability that you get in the gametes, right? It's the key driver of the diversity of the next generation. So that's it from a kind of studying standpoint, right? Ideally, you've got mitosis down. Uh, it's relatively straightforward. There's a bit of language that you need to know to be able to understand what we're going to talk about today. Pardon me. Meiosis two is also pretty straightforward. The only difference between meiosis two and mitosis is in meiosis two, the cells are haploid. That's really the main difference. Meiosis one is uh, really the foundation of the law of independent assortment, right? How, what affects one, what allele we get for one gene has or should have, according to the law, no effect on what you get for a different gene in terms of alleles, right? So all of that and uh, recombination, which generates or reshuffles uh, genetic information from your chromosomes, that's what really generates kind of new combinations of alleles in your offspring, right? So that's it from a studying kind of just material point of view. But really meiosis is far more interesting than that. Meiosis is really the way the reason why you are the way you are. Ah, there's a bit of, you know, upbringing and stuff in there too, no doubt. But the reason why you are not 50-50 uh, like mother and father, right? So if you look at your parents, you know, you can't say, oh, I've got mum's nose, dad's mouth, mum's toes, dad's ears, so on and so forth, right? You do tend to have to some extent, things which do look more like one parent than another and vice versa, depending on what you're looking at. But there's a whole bunch of stuff which is different from either of them, right? Yet you get all of your genetic information from your parents. So how do you end up looking kind of like both of them, but also different? That's meiosis, meiosis one in particular. 
So that's kind of the consequence of meiosis one, right? The benefit, I guess, of meiosis one or meiosis in general and sexual reproduction is it generates new variation in the offspring, it generates a diversity of offspring which have new combinations of alleles that their parents did not have. So sex is costly, right? There is a lot of risk and cost associated with sexual reproduction, right? Actually, anybody have an idea what those costs might be? Costs and risks of sexual reproduction. What kind of things can you think of? As opposed to just cloning yourself, asexual reproduction. <laughs> yeah. Death, that's right. Getting eaten by your partner, which just doesn't sound like a good idea. There's actually a fitness benefit to that. Funny enough, Michael, that's a funny... Uh, example to use i found that the the nutrients the male provides the female increases the success or fitness of his offspring so it's a sacrifice for your kids yeah uh the actual risks to the mother of pregnancy Right. And so in humans, clearly that that's uh, there's risks associated with that um, in the wild uh, also. Right. Because you are slower, uh, easier to catch, um, you know, stuff like that. What else? What other risks might there be or costs? Costs as well. Hippos and snow leopards are a good example of this, funny enough. And this kind of comes to mind because I just rewatched uh, the Jumanji films uh, with Dwayne Johnson. Obviously not getting eaten, but to kind of put you out of your suspense, uh, hippos and also snow leopards uh, tend to kill the offspring of uh, the females they mate with that aren't theirs. So hippos, it's quite common uh, if a you know um, dominant bull hippo joins a pack of hippos, uh, he'll almost certainly try and kill the young offspring of the existing. Uh, females before mating with them to increase the potential fitness of his own offspring essentially snow leopards do the same thing too what about terms of genetic yeah no sucks right uh i'm glad i'm not a snow leopard or a hippo um what about terms of genetic material that you pass on how much of your genetic material do you pass on to your offspring? Yeah, it's half. It's exactly half if you're a, if you're a well, it's, yeah, it's around half. A little bit more from the, the mothers in terms of mitochondrial DNA, but to all intents and purposes, half, right? If you reproduce asexually, all of your genetic information gets passed on. Right, so if you want to, you know, ensure the success of your genes going forward, you know, like the selfish gene theory, sexual reproduction is like half rate almost. You know, you only get half of your genetic information into the next generation. So all of these costs have to have a benefit. Otherwise, sexual reproduction would never have made it evolutionary oh yeah good question cynthia so if you reproduce asexually the cost to that is lack of genetic diversity in your offspring 
And so all of your offspring will be genetically identical to you, right? And so there's trade-offs, right? Asexual reproduction is very fast, right? And all of your genetic material goes into the next generation. But on the other hand, if the environment changes, you're screwed, or at least your offspring are, right? Because they're only adapted to the environment which their parents or grandparents exist in. Right, so that's the cost, right? And there's always trade-offs, you know, and this is kind of where the balance comes. Whereas the sexual reproduction costs are higher, but if you're in a changing environment, and that could mean in terms of weather, predation, disease, all that kind of stuff, then the benefits are some of your offspring are going to have a combination of alleles which is better suited to that changed environment. And so their fitness relative to you will go up essentially or either that or maintain the same given the changing environment. And so there are actually not all, but many organisms, mostly invertebrates. Yeah, I don't think there are any vertebrates that reproduce asexually that I can think of. Um, but insects and nematodes like the ones I work on, many of them reproduce asexually under you know great conditions things don't change everything's great super happy lots of you know lots of food for your little worms to you know baby worms to go and eat and stuff but as soon as the environment changes they can switch to sexual reproduction it's kind of like having your cake and eating it basically in terms of reproduction in fact, one of the ones I uh, worked on a parasite for my PhD, this is many, many moons ago, uh, this parasite could actually detect the degree of host immune response. So here's an example of a changing environment, right? So when the rat started to develop an immune response against the parasite, which was bad for the parasite, it would switch to sexual reproduction. And so that would generate, you know, novelty so that if, you know, it's babies, which is kind of weird to think about parasites in that way, go back into the same rat, they'd have a greater chance of surviving, you know, and then making it to reproductive adulthood and producing offspring. So that's what it's all about, right? It's all about being able to reproduce and your offspring being able to reproduce. So anyway, meiosis is really... Uh, the key driver of that uh, diversity, right? And really everything in meiosis, this is arguably the most important thing you can learn about meiosis, is it's all geared towards randomness. It's all random, right? Which alleles you get, which chromosomes you get in terms of maternal or paternal, uh, where recombination occurs, even which gamete fertilizes which gamete from the other sex is random. Right. And that's the whole point. You know, think of giant clams, you know. For a week or so, they just squirt out sperm. And then they stop, go, whew, that was tough. And then they spend a week squirting out eggs. And those eggs and sperm, they just kind of float around in the ocean currents until they find uh, gamete of the opposite sex, ideally not from their own uh, parent. Can't get more random than that. Yes, yeah, so again, going back to your point, Cynthia, lack of genetic diversity in your offspring is a big problem for asexual reproduction. Anyway, so keep all of that in mind. It will help explain or help you understand a lot of what's going on in meiosis one. Right. It's all about randomness, right? generating new combinations of alleles. Okay, so we just covered that. Kind of talked about this, but this is super, super important. Okay. In mitosis, yeah. one deployed cell equals two identical 
deployed daughters. Okay. Straightforward. In meiosis, one deployed cell equals after two rounds of cell division. Remember, this isn't just one round, this is two rounds. One of the reasons why meiosis is so bonkers. Okay. Or non identical, that's really important, haploid daughters. And it's very important to refer to which round of meiosis you are referring, right? And I will use this language in the exam, so be aware of that. You have to be very precise about what you're talking about. So in meiosis one, one deployed Ah, come on, to two haploid daughters. Reduction. It's called reductional division or reduction division because you're reducing the ploidy, right? How many of each chromosome you have. So all of you, bar your uh, reproductive tissues, well, really, by your germ cells has two copies of every chromosome. You're diploid. Right? So we have 23 unique chromosomes, one through 22 in a sex chromosome. You have two of each of those in your somatic tissue. Right? So the first step in generating gametes is to cut that in half. Somatic cells, 46 chromosomes total. After one round of meiosis, meiosis one, each daughter will have 23 chromosomes. Still one of, you know, you'll still have one of everything. You know, it's not losing chromosomes, one hopes. But you've gone from having two of every chromosome to having just one, right? That's part of why meiosis one is so important. In meiosis two, one haploid cell to two haploid daughters. And that's called equational division because the ploidy level how many sets of chromosomes you have does not change another way of talking about it is meiosis one is all about separating homologous oh i hate typing that out chromosomes and recombination. Meiosis two is all about separating sister chromatids. And that's why meiosis two is analogous to mitosis. There are two big things that happen in meiosis. Well, meiosis one, sorry. One, recombination, also called crossing over, also called synapsis. Ah, there's a lot of different words for that. I don't know why. Right. That's between homologous chromosomes. 
and that occurs in meiosis up there come on prophase one So my analogy, which isn't a very good one, but it's the best I've come up with, is if meiosis is all about reshuffling a deck of cards, right? That's really what the second bit that I'm about to come to is. Recombination is like getting two uh, kings, like king of spades and a king of hearts. And if it's a carefully tearing off the top of one card and the other one and swapping them. So you have a king of hearts with a little bit of a king of spades at the top. And then you have a king of spades with a little bit of king of hearts at the top. That's recombination, essentially. Right. So it's fine scale uh, mixing of alleles, essentially between chromosomes. Second big deal is random alignment uh, of homologous chromosome pairs, also called tetrads, on the metaphase plate. And that occurs in metaphase one. And is the, I don't know, not molecular, cellular basis, I guess, for the law of independent assortment. Okay, so that's kind of giving you the, the big picture overview, right? And also the things that kind of really matter. And again, I always say to students and they ask me, oh, what's going to be in the exam? Listen to what I talk about. If I spend a bunch of time talking about certain things or go, you really need to focus on this. And you can be pretty much guaranteed that there's going to be a bunch of questions on it. You know, because it's important. That's why I want to make sure that you, you know, know and understand this stuff. Otherwise, I wouldn't talk about it. Obviously, like the asides on like cats and dogs and other random stuff. Don't worry so much about that. I'm not going to be testing you about, you know, what hippos do to their offspring. But uh, this stuff, very much so. Okay, so going to have a little bit of a whip through the actual phases or steps and then we'll circle back pardon me to those two big things All right so give you the overview of the entire process and then we will focus on recombination and the random alignment of chromosomes or homologous chromosome pairs Okay, so if you wanted to simplify things a bunch, and this simplifies it a wee little bit too much in some ways, this is basically what meiosis looks like. You have your first round of cell division, right? So just as with mitosis, every chromosome is replicated, right? So the G1, S, and G2 phase are the same as with mitosis. All the preparation that is needed for the M phase in mitosis is also needed for the M phase in meiosis. Right, so the preparation is the same. What happens after that point is different. And so each chromosome is replicated. That's why you have these sister chromatids, like these, these classic kind of X-shaped chromosomes. However, 
these chromosomes pair up. So a maternal chromosome will line up very precisely with the paternal chromosome, and they will get stuck together like that. Right. So then what happens is uh, you separate those chromosomes, right? So those chromosomes that are stuck together are pulled apart. So one daughter will have, you know, uh, say the maternal chromosome for chromosome one. The other daughter will have the paternal for chromosome one. And for every single chromosome pair, it will be one or the other, right? So this is where you go from diploid to haploid, right? So here we have two N, N being the number of unique chromosomes, 23 in our case, right? So this would be 46. Uh, the N for this cell is two. You have two different chromosomes, you have two of each of them, four in total. So this gets reduced to one N or just N, because you've split up these pairs. So this daughter has the red of this chromosome and the blue one of the second chromosome. It still has two unique chromosomes, but it only has one of each, right? That's the reductional division. That's the diploid to haploid. Now, obviously these daughter cells you can't go through fertilization with those because they have still the sister chromatids, right? So each chromosome that you do have has two copies. Essentially, you have twice as much DNA as you should do. You don't necessarily have more information, although we'll kind of get to that later. And this is why it's a bit of a simplification. But you do have more DNA than you should have. So just as with mitosis, those sister chromatids now have to be pulled apart and one going into each daughter cell. So for each daughter of meiosis one, right, which goes from diploid to haploid, each one of those daughters then divides again to produce the, uh, the actual gametes themselves. That's how you go from one diploid to four haploid, technically speaking. Actually, it's not totally true in female humans, in women, uh, in men, yes, this applies. We have four sperm from one germ cell. Uh, in women, you actually only have one oocyte or one egg from one uh, germ cell. Because at each of the rounds of cell division, the, the second daughter kind of gets absorbed Basically, it, it uh, gets killed. Don't know why, but it just does. It's crazy. So yeah, once you go through the whole process of uh, ovulation, uh, because all of your oocytes are paused actually in meiosis one, then uh, the daughter from meiosis one gets, uh, basically all the DNA gets put into a little Body called a polar body, and that gets destroyed. And then it goes through again, and the same thing happens. So you end up with one egg that then travels down the fallopian tubes. Women are very complicated, is all I can say, <laughs> at all kinds of levels. Anyway, so have the same phases, big, right? In the different stages prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, each one will have a number associated with it. Because what happens in metaphase two or me metaphase two looks like is very, very different from what metaphase one looks like, right? So whenever you're asked about this, pay attention because it makes a very big difference. It's not enough to just say metaphase in meiosis. Uh, which one? Right. And what they look like are very different as well. So, meiosis one, there's a lot going on in 
prophase. That's why it's kind of, there's a lot of uh, uh, time focused on it. So as with mitosis, some things stay the same, right? So the centrosomes push themselves apart to opposite sides of the pole. Spindle fibers form. Nuclear membrane disappears. That's all the same. Chromosomes condense too. However, and this is the very, very big deal, as they condense, these homologous chromosomes, so you can see this one just like a nice Crayola squiggle, line up. Right? And they line up with the help of a complex called the synaptonemal complex, which is a long and complicated word. Ah, uh, come on. There you go. And this is super important and it's actually quite astonishing. In many ways, one could think of it as being magic, right? So you know that chromosome, individual chromosomes can be millions of base pairs long, right? Millions of individual letters. And yet this synaptonemal complex lines them up base by base over millions of bases. It's astonishing. I don't actually even know how they do that. I don't know if it is known and I just don't know it or if it is not known yet, right? It's crazy. And the reason why that's so important is later on in prophase, in late prophase, we're going to swap bits of neighboring chromosomes homologous chromosomes. And so that alignment has to be utterly perfect. Otherwise, when you swap bits, you'll end up with one chromosome a little bit longer and the other chromosome a little bit shorter. And that's not a good thing, right? You'll lose information. And if that difference happens to be in a gene, then you'll end up with two screwed up copies of that gene. So this alignment is super important. And what you can see is that these pairs, they line up next to each other, right? So if this is, these are two sister chromatids, essentially the chromosomes line up. So two non-sister chromatids are next to each other. They're called non-sisters because they're not identical. This, is, this non-sister is from one homologous chromosome there's non-sisters from the other one, right? So those line up perfectly. Then in late prophase, so this is before the homologous pairs get kind of dragged around to the metaphase plate. Before that, those non-sister chromatids swap bits. Yeah, some of the material, I guess, would be good. And this is another important part of prophase one. Not only does this recombination, crossing over, synapsis, whatever you want to call it, shuffle those alleles, right? So some alleles between these two molecules chromosomes will be the same. Some of them will be different. Some get swapped, some don't, right? Also, right, don't forget that these two sister chromatids are stuck together. 
these two sister chromatids are stuck together. So if you swap bits, now these two homologous chromosomes are stuck together. Right. And this is what holds the homologous pair together as it gets dragged around the cell by the spindle fibers before ending up on the metaphase plate. This is a really, really important point. This is how you get this working properly. Okay. Any questions so far? Wait, sir, I just want to clarify. So in the image, there's two late prophase ones. So on the first one, that's when they pair up like the different ones. And then the second one is when they switch. So, so this is, pieces. It's, a, it's a good question. It's difficult to represent in uh, kind of snapshots because it's really a continuous process. So this process starts right at the very beginning of prophase when the chromosomes start condensing. And it ends at late prophase with the chiasmata, the crossovers. And so it kind of occurs on a kind of continuous process between the two. And so uh, really this is, I mean, this is part of the challenge of finding good images. I might need to find a better one for this one. The homologous chromosomes actually pair up very early on in prophase but they only appear as pairs in late prophase. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, because they've sufficiently condensed. But really, you know, this crossing over has already occurred, right? So this is kind of, these pictures are showing like different aspects of what's going on. It's very hard to show them in sequence, right? Without confusing the shit out of you, basically. And so best to can, I'm not going to go, oh, what happens in like this part of prophase? Because it's a really difficult thing to pin down. But I want you to get the sense that this is a continuous process where they line up and swap over and condense down. Like almost all of those things are happening kind of at the same time, sort of, in prophase. Yeah. There's a lot of arm waving around in that, but uh, it's it's a hard thing to describe. But the key point is that A, you understand this does happen in prophase. B, it's a process from beginning when those chromosomes are condensing to the end when they've uh, crossed over. And C, that crossing over both generates diversity and also holds those homologous pairs together. Those are the, the main kind of points I really want you to get from this. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, so now we have on the metaphase plate, homologous chromosome pairs held together, right? And they're held together again by those chiasmata, right? Those swapped bits. And where that happens, right? It could be like that, right? It could be like that. That recombination, that synapsis or chiasmata could be anywhere along that chromosome arm. And typically it's on both chromosome arms, but not always, but it's always on at least one. Because otherwise those, those homologous chromosomes will just get pulled apart by the spindle fibers. There's nothing held, holding them together otherwise. So we have the same deal in metaphase one. We have our M phase checkpoint. And actually, again, this is always fun. I'm not picking on you ladies, it's just your I don't know, meiosis is far more interesting than the guys. Um, 
but all of your oocytes, right? So those are cells that have not yet been activated to become eggs, which you do once a month. All of your oocytes of which you have, ooh, how many do you have? Bloody loads, tens of thousands of them. All right, you're only ever gonna use a few hundred of them, which is also kind of nuts. But they're all paused at this point. So every one of the ladies in the class, all of your oocytes were paused at this point while you were still an, a fetus, before you were born. Crazy. Anyway, so the M phase checkpoints check in for the exact same thing as it does in mitosis. Are all of the chromosome pairs aligned on the metaphase plate? Right? Exactly same reason that you care about this in mitosis. Because if not, you end up with one daughter having one more chromosome than it should do and the other daughter having one too few, which generally speaking is disastrous. Right, sorry, my phone's pinging at me. Don't know if I'm butt dialing people, I don't think so. All right, and we talked about Down syndrome, right? I can't, sometimes I forget, you know, what I talk about with different classes. So there are, I actually need to make a list of this, very, very few occurrences where you can lose or gain a chromosome and still make it all the way through development to being a baby. In fact, I think one of the weirdest one is, uh, it's called cri du chat, which in French means cry of the cat, which is a partial loss of chromosome five, I think. So not even the whole chromosome five, but part of it. And the reason why it's called that is because the, you know, the individuals that have that have a malformed larynx. And so when they speak, it sounds like a cat yowling, which is just nuts. Anyway, so this is super, super, super important. And there's some funky stuff going on here, right? And we'll talk about funkiest numerous to us in a little bit. So, Ah, question to the class. What's the protein that holds together the sister chromatids? Begins with C. Good job, Jonathan. And it didn't auto correct you, which is fabulous. It always auto corrects me. Right, cohesin. So there's cohesin all the way along these sister chromatids. But we're going to be pulling apart the homologous chromosomes, which remember are stuck together by the bits of DNA that they've swapped. So we want to pull those apart, but not these. We want to pull the homologous chromosomes apart, but not the sister chromatids. So cohesin God dang it, stop autocorrecting me. No. All right, there you go. Cohesin in meiosis, at least meiosis one, is protected at the center of the chromosomes, chromatids, by a, another protein called shugoshin. And that is a cool word, and it means guardian spirit in Japanese. I'm not usually like a big fan of funky words for, for genes, but this one is pretty awesome, right? So in my in anaphase one, only the cohesin is in. Hey, at the ends is destroyed by, oh, ah, here's another question. Revision. What's the protein that gets activated by the anaphase promoting complex and destroys cohesin? 
think about what's happening to the DNA in anaphase. Yeah, separates. I figured that you meant to put an extra A in there somewhere, Cynthia. But yeah, separates. <laughs> no, I'm no one to talk. My spelling is also, uh, my typing at least is, is pretty poor. So yeah, Shigoshin protects protects the cohesin at the center. This is why the chromosomes get pulled apart, not the chromatids, because the chromosome, chromosomes are only held together at the ends. Right? And so if separates destroy the, the DNA all the way along, remember, We've got a spindle fiber attached to one chromatid of one chromosome and a spindle fiber attached to the other one. If cohesin was destroyed all the way along the chromatids, essentially this sister chromatid would get pulled over here. This one will get pulled over here and then you'd be left with these ones kind of like hanging around in the middle. So the cohesin at the center, like at the bottom, like my palm, I guess, right, is protected. So when the cohesion of the tips is destroyed, the tension in the spindle fibers pulls those chromosomes apart. And then you get telophase. So this is actually, you know, different pictures work well for different things, but this one's really good because if you look really, really closely at anaphase two, let me zoom up a little bit for you there. You can see that these chromosomes now consist of chromatids that are the same as the parents. Each chromosome ha still has two sister chromatids they're not really sisters anymore if you think about it because they're not identical one looks the same as the parent the other is a mix of the two All right so if you look at it like uh this one down here the top left one right you have one entirely red chromatid. You have another chromatid, which is mostly red and has a little bit of blue at the end of it as the result of synapsis or recombination crossing over, whatever you want to call it, between those two homologous chromosomes. So whatever you see in one, you see the opposite in the other chromosome. Right. So this is actually, this is a really good image for getting that across. And those ones which are mixed are called recombinant. So that's language that we'll be using a bunch when we're talking about parental chromosomes. Those essentially look like what were in your parents and recombinant chromosomes, which are a mix of the two randomly, like where that mixing occurs. Now, just to dial it back a little bit, remember I talked about the second big thing, which is actually in many ways a bigger deal than recombination. The second big deal is this, not the recombination, but how those chromosome pairs line up on the metaphase plate. Which way round that pair lines up is random.
So each chromosome pair, essentially, has a 50-50 chance of lining up one way round versus the other. And that is for each chromosome pair. So if you have two chromosomes, two unique chromosomes, n of two, and you have two of them, that gives you four possible combinations. Essentially, it could be, you know, mother, father, mother, father, father, mother, father, mother, mother, father, father, mother, and then the other one. Confuse myself, right? Four possible combinations. If, like us, you have N of 23, this is something that will blow your mind. You have eight. 0.4 million possible combinations. 8.4 million. It's two to the power of 23, I think. Yeah. So essentially, every time any one of you produces a gamete, There are 8.4 million combinations of chromosomes it could have between maternal versus paternal for each chromosome. Ouch. This is the basis for the law of independent assortment and a very large part of the diversity of gametes or genetic diversity, I guess. So if you have a gene on chromosome one and you have two different alleles or two different copy versions of that gene, which one you get in your gamete, whatever gamete you're looking at, has a 50-50 chance, right? If you're heterozygous for another gene on chromosome two, which one you get, 50-50 chance. Chromosome three, 50-50. Chromosome four, 50-50. For every single chromosome, which way round? It could be like that. Could be like that, could be like that, could be like that. For every single pair, it is totally random. So which way they line up, totally random. Where they recombine, totally random. Which gamete fertilizes which gamete, totally random. Well, I mean, mostly, mostly random. Even which oocyte gets activated, totally random. Huge amount of randomness going on all the way through. So let's just zoom this back down again. Right, and so this really kind of lays that out in terms of, you know, pictures. You could have this combination, you could have this combination, you could have the opposite of those combinations too. So depending on which way round it is for each, 
you'll get a different combination of gametes. But when you add up all of those different combinations, you're going to get your one to one to one ratio. So if you think back to the F1 generation of a dihybrid cross, two genes, two alleles for each, the F1s are heterozygous for both. They produce how many gametes, different gametes? Four. What ratio do they produce them in? One to one to one to one. And the reason for that is this random alignment of chromosome pairs. Okay, super, super important. Any questions so far? Good time to speak up if you do. Still have ooh, nearly 20 minutes. Ooh. Okay. So Moses one, where all the sexy sauce is happening. Moses two, cleaning up the mess is kind of how I view it. In between, there is a potentially a stage called interkinesis. Well, I mean, there is interkinesis. What it is varies from organism to organism. Some of them, they go through the whole kind of telophase, reforming the nuclear membrane, decondensing chromosomes, spindle fibers disappear, so on and so forth. Others, other organisms don't. They just go straight from cytokinesis to uh, essentially to metaphase two. It varies. But all of the material needed for both rounds of cell division is made during interphase before meiosis or part of meiosis one. So all of the proteins, the centrosomes, the DNA, everything, all happens in interphase before the first round of meiosis. Then meiosis two is pretty straightforward, right? And again, oh, actually, this is really nice. Always discover new things about this stuff. Okay, so remember, I was talking about plane of cell division, right? And how it rotates from, which one's this one? Like that, uh, by 90 degrees, each cell division, essentially like so. It's what generates that ball of cells that you see in a early uh, yeah, embryo, essentially. This is really good because this holds true to that as well, right? So here, the centrosomes move to the sides, left and right, plane of division is vertical between those two. Second round of cell division. Now those centrosomes start on one side. Now they'll move top and bottom. Plane of cell division is horizontal. Cool, huh? And you can see the metaphase plate here. Well, it's called equatorial plate, but it's the same kind of deal. Big difference in uh, my fingers work like that. Metaphase one, chromosomes look like so. Metaphase two, tip to tip, just like in mitosis, because this is all about separating the sister chromatids. Mitosis one is all about separating the chromosomes. Right? So just think of that as well. Are those chromosomes tip to tip or are they, you know, in a pair? They'll tell you also which round of my meiosis you're looking at. So these line up, same deal, M phase checkpoint. Are they all aligned on the metaphase plate? If yes, anaphase proceeds. And now you have your, well, after cytokinesis and telophase, you have your four gametes. 
if this is not in a female vertebrate, I think that's true for most vertebrates. I'm not actually 100% sure. I'm no anatomist, Ana anatomist, ah, whatever, someone who studies anatomy. So if this was a uh, male human, each one of these will develop further into a sperm. If this is in a female human, this would look completely different, but you would still end up with a haploid daughter, right? With a totally random mix of chromosomes, crossing overs, and so on and so forth. So if you look real closely at this, you'll see that each one of these cells is different. This one has, if we're calling the red maternal and the blue paternal, it has a uh, maternal chromosome one, paternal chromosome two. This one has a maternal, uh, paternal chromosome one, maternal chromosome two. These two are, have only parentals, parental chromosomes. These two have only recombinant chromosomes. If you were to do this all over again, second round of uh, another germ cell uh, dividing in meiosis, you might have a mix, one parental, one recombinant, one parental, one recombinant. It is totally random. Totally, completely, absolutely random, which what you get in each gamete. And so each gamete is different to the other very, very different from mitosis, where you have identical daughter cells. These are very much non-identical. Okay, questions? Okay, a lot of stuff to learn here. Okay, this is pretty simple. This really covers what we've been talking about earlier. Oh, cool, tip to tip. Chromosomes are tip to tip either in metaphase two or metaphase of mitosis. So if you look at here, here we go. Right. So this is metaphase of mitosis. Metaphase two of meiosis two. It looks pretty much the same, right? Go okay, from that one. This one obviously has more chromosomes involved. That's, uh, does it? Sorry, I'm just gonna have to move all you peeps out of the way. Get out of it. Yeah, so that one has, I couldn't see what was behind the, the videos. Uh, this one has an N of three. So it has an N of three because it has two of chromosome one, two of chromosome two and two of chromosome three. So it has a total of six chromosomes, right? That makes sense? It has three different chromosomes, essentially, big, middle, and small, kind of like mama bear, papa bear, and you know, baby bear. And it has two of each because it's diploid, because it's mitosis. This has an N of two, right? Because it's a different organism, let's say. But it only has two of each, right? This cell only has two chromosomes, not four. This one has two, not four. 
because it is in meiosis. So these cells are haploid. That's another clue as well. So if I were to put up a picture in your exam, uh, maybe I know how to do that, maybe I don't. Um, but if I were and I was to give you a picture and I said, this is a cell with an N of two, is it at metaphase mitosis, metaphase one, metaphase two, anaphase, and whatever else I'd put in there as a filler. You go, N of two, how many chromosomes do I have? Two. Okay, this is haploid. And they're tip to tip, right? So it's got to be metaphase two. That's the line of reasoning that you need to use. Now, if there were four lined up here, that would be metaphase of mitosis. If there are four lined up like so, that would be metaphase one of meiosis one. So even though meiosis two and metaphase are largely analogous, they are not the same because the number of chromosomes is different. Good question. Okay, so I'm going to use the last few minutes just to kind of go through. I uh, always forget what I've got at the end here. Now, oh, this is again another uh, oversimplification. So, this is a, oh, actually, why is this an oversimplification? Question to you. What is missing here? So this is all about the random alignment of chromosomes. You can see the different combinations. That's one contributor to genetic diversity of the gametes. What's the other one? Have a look at the, the chromosomes on the right. Blow that up a little bit. Yeah, there are no recombinants, right? So this does not include recombination because all of these chromosomes look exactly like the parents, right? So this isn't taken into account recombination. Right, so that's why this is an oversimplification. This one, come on, does. Right, so this is why you end up with, you know, from N of uh, two, this is why you end up with four different possible gametes. Now, just to kind of go back through what I talked about before, right? So in terms of what happens at which stage of meiosis versus mitosis, mitosis, these sister chromatids are held together by cohesin, you know, along the length, right? So when anaphase or all the chromosomes aligned on the metaphase plate and anaphase is triggered, all of that cohesion is destroyed. That allows those sister chromatids to be pulled apart. In myosin, however, the cohesion, which you can see here at the center, around the centromeres where the kinetic cores are, that is protected by shigoshin. And that means that in anaphase one, those sister those chromatids are still stuck together. So each chromosome is pulled apart. It's only in anaphase two that the cohesin at the center, because Shogoshin, Shogoshin, sorry, is destroyed. Only then does that cohesin get broken down, allowing the sister chromatids or the sort of sister chromatids to get pulled apart. And that's pretty much 
summarized here. So remember, all the important, or well, most of the important stuff happens in meiosis one. Pairing of homologous, uh, typing that out, chromosomes and recombination synapses crossing over in prophase one. And then random alignment of homologous chromosome pairs. Chromosome, oh, that was terrible. See, I told you my type was crap. And again, those are called tetrads because there's essentially four bits of DNA there. So really the random alignment of chromosomes in metaphase two, using my card sharp analogy, the analogy would be if you had two different packs of cards and for every card in that pack, you randomly picked one from one pack over the other. That's essentially the random alignment in metaphase one. And it's like a flip of a coin, 50-50, equal probability of getting one chromosome versus the other of a homologous pair. And those two things plus randomness of fertilization. And there is a little bit going on with fertilization uh, for sure, because there's a competition between, you know, sperm or spores as to who fertilizes the oocyte or the, the egg. But generally speaking, it's random. And so those two things plus the randomness of fertilization equals the genetic diversity of the next generation. And then Cool example, each gamete involved in fertilization, if I can spell that out, fertilization is I could, one in 8.4 million. So you, and that's you are, one in, and I've got to do the calculator thing. Nope, not that one, that one. Uh, was it eight? Yeah, that's, you are one in 70 trillion. And that, capitals, doesn't even take into account recombination. So you are truly unique, right? Your parents would have to have more than 70 trillion offspring, which makes the eyes water. And certainly they wouldn't be very financially well off, at least until all their kids grew up. Before you would have, just on the basis of random alignment of chromosomes and random fertilization, just on the basis of those two things, you would have to have more than 70 trillion offspring before you are likely to find another offspring which had the same combination of chromosomes. Now you can see how truly, right, you get 
that amazing amount of genetic diversity in the next generation. Meiosis is pretty darn cool in a lot of ways. All right, I need to scarf some lunch and get to lab. So I'm going to hoof it. Exam will be open from start of class time on Thursday until midnight. I will be in the Zoom on Thursday. Uh, most likely checking my email and reading the news and just other bits and pieces. If you have any questions about the exam or the material or any of that jazz, right? I'll also be available for most of the day, kind of in and out, depending on, you know, what's going on, walking the dog and stuff, or dogs. If you have questions, but I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer them like super, super fast within like 10, 15 minutes. But I will check all the way through the day if you have any questions. Okay, so that exam will appear as if by magic at 9.30 a.m. on Thursday. And I'll type that out as well. Sam Wilm. Uh, think the homework due date has passed, Clarice, but if you weren't able to do it, just send me an email and I'll open it up for you. So you have the chance to do that. Uh, Give me a second, Jasmine. Be there in a, in a tick. Exam will at 30 a.m. Thursday morning. And close at 12 p.m. that night. Note that the due date will not B Thursday. The reason for that is that if anyone has any issues with taking the exam, I can open it up for them without the answers have been made available. Right. So you'll get the answers and feedback after the due date. So the due date has to be kind of pushed back a bit until, um, you know, usually the weekend, like if someone's internet goes down on Thursday or whatever. Right, I can open it up again for them. Because as soon as the exam due date has passed, I cannot open the exam. So if you have any issues taking the exam on Thursday, let me know straight away or as soon as you're able to do so. If you can't do it that day, do it the next day. Don't leave it a week. Because if you do, you won't be able to take the exam. And that's simply because all the answers will be available after the due date. Uh, crap. I always get, yeah, Maricela, you're right. I hate the whole PM thing. Midnight. I should have typed that. Yeah, there you go. 11.59 PM. Always get confused by that stuff. And someone asked about time limit. You'll, oops. Let me just change that back. You'll have one hour, 15 minutes for 40 questions. Some of them will be real simple. Some of them will not. Yes, oh, multiple choice and multiple answer. Give me a second. And if it's multiple answer, there will always be a pickle that apply at the end of the question. So you don't have to guess. See the multiple choice or, pardon me, if it says pickle that apply, pickle that apply. However, and I will get to the other questions in a second, do not Tick all the answers without being sure that all the answers are correct. Because there will be a penalty, not a big one, but there will be a penalty for picking the wrong answers. And it's usually a bit less than what one of the other answers is worth. And there is partial credit. So if you get two out of three right, you'll get two thirds of the points. But if you pick two right ones and a wrong one, you'll get, say, 
50% or half of the points. Okay, so be very careful about which ones you answer. Tick all the ones you're really sure of and then think hard about the rest of them. Um, Kiana, no, you can take this in your browser. Be in Blackboard. And we'll be open book, browser, uh, whatever. Right, so you will be free to look up answers on the internet if you wish. You will not have time to do so for all those questions. And you will not be able to find the answers to all of those questions. Many of them you'll have to work out for yourself. Chi-square test, for example. Right. So don't rely on being able to just look up stuff like on your phone or whatever. A, it takes too much time. B, you're not going to be able to do that for all of it. You have to study your ass off for this one, right? It will be a hard exam. No sugar cone at all. Cool. Now I've really got to go because I've got to get to lab in eight minutes. So if you have any questions, though, just send me an email. I'll get to them as soon as I can, you know, ideally within a couple of hours, if not within that day. Okay. Good luck for Thursday, and I'll see some of you in a little bit.